So good morning all. Um, um, I'm planning to give you some tips regarding the surgical viva. And um, you know that uh, you have a clinical case, a long case, and uh, possibly one clinical scenario and one short case. And that will be followed by a surgical viva. And I'm sure that most of you will be too apprehensive about uh, what, to be, uh, what will be asked in the viva and what all things to be done. But I need to tell you one thing is that uh, the viva is just, uh, just a recapture of what you have learned over the years and there is nothing uh, new in it. So whatever you have learned is just put it into practice and then you will be able to answer most of the questions. So don't, don't get baffled by the term called as viva. All that is done is to know uh, what you have already learned. And most of the examiners will be very friendly with you to know what you really know. So that is what uh, to be done. As you all know, the viva is divided into four stations. One is X-ray. Second is uh, you will have uh, a specimen station, and then you will have an instrument station and uh, operative surgery. All these are designated to ask about what you really know. I'm doing this because uh, I was supposed to take a class for my undergraduates, but uh, because of the COVID time and the, we could not have a direct class. So we are just uh, recapturing what is basically required for you. I'm not telling you this will be asked, but you should have a vague idea regarding what all things can be asked in each heads. So a quick review of x-rays is what is being done in the first session and that will be followed by instruments and specimen in the later course of time. So let us start with the x-rays and when you have x-ray stationed, you will normally have two to three minutes time and uh, you will be seeing one in non-contrast and one contrast x-ray, one plain x-ray as well as contrast x-ray and the examiners will be asking based on that. For an undergraduate exam and also to a certain extent for national board as well as the postgraduate exams, you'll be concentrating on basic things and then trying to build up what you really know. If you answer well, you will have more number of x-rays being asked to you and that will only add to your additional marks and you are strengthening your total output as it is. Right. So uh, commonly that is the, the, the x-rays that, that are asked for you is a plain x-ray and, uh, and contrast x-ray. Sometimes you'll be shown some special investigation and just asked about what is it and how it is done and how will you approach the case. So let us start uh, with uh, plain x-rays and uh, plain x-rays include x-ray of the chest as well as x-ray of the abdomen. Those are the usual x-rays. Very rarely we will keep x-rays of the other areas also. And you know in orthopedics you will have x-rays of the limb regions and the pelvis. Right. So start with an x-ray uh, of the x-ray chest. That is a commonest x-ray that is being that is usually asked. And when you get an x-ray of the chest what you need to look at is the what view it is. That is the first thing to be seen. Then you need to see whether there is any rotations of the film so that one side becomes more prominent. Then you assess about the rib cage as well as then the soft tissues around the rib cage to see whether there are any air pockets. And then you see the ribs and then you see the pleural cavity and the lung parenchymal shadows as well as the mediastinal shadow. So this is one of the commonest x-ray that is kept in surgery where you will be given and this x-ray and asked to comment. And so you can see from this x-ray there is definitely there is a fluid level. And there is a fluid level in an x-ray and when you have an history of trauma, or if you don't have an history of trauma, then you should be thinking in terms of a, thinking in terms of a, a, either in form of hydrothorax or hydrothorax or pyothorax. If there is non-traumatic event, and if there is a trauma, this is a clear-cut evidence of hemothorax, isn't it? And there is a fluid level also. There is a collapsed lung. So all these things put together that forms a hemothorax. So the next question will be on the application side. You will be asked about where do you get rib fractures. You know that answer. They are all common. All and you will be asked about where, how will you treat this patient. So whenever you are treating any trauma patient, follow the basic principle of airway, breathing, circulation, and then drainage. And the drainage, you know, is basically by putting a chest tube. Again, this patient x-ray, you can see that if you look at this side, you can see there are multiple fractured ribs on one side. There is air in the air in the uh, in the subcutaneous tissue 
uh, on the on the right side and uh, you can see the rib cage has gone in so when the rib cage is gone in and there is a diffuse patchy infiltration of the parenchymal region also so and uh, all all the and you can see the trachea is also shifted to the left all these things put together and this patient also has got some fractures here also so looking at all these things uh, all these things patient has got multiple rib fractures at different side one and one here one here and one here and you can see there is a, there is the rib cage has gone in so what is the diagnosis here here the diagnosis is a flail chest flail chest is when two or more ribs are fractured at two different points and uh, uh, they will act as an independent fragment and exhibit paradoxical respiration so you will be asked about what is flail chest how will you manage this patient and so you need to know the management principles of the flail chest and that will be the questions uh, will that will be asked and essentially whenever there is a flail chest the most important thing to note is whether the patient has got desaturation and if the spo2 is low you have to support the ventilation with uh, intermittent positive pressure uh, ventilation and also when there is hemothorax or pneumothorax in any case of trauma you will have to think about a chest tube insertion so naturally the questions would be where will you put the chest tube you know the chest tube is normally put in the triangle of safety bounded by the anterior axillary line the mid axillary line and the fifth rib because to avoid injury to the solid organ so you will be asked about that you will also be asked about when will you remove the chest tube what is the criteria how will you remove the chest tube and all these things so that is the x-ray of the chest now here again there is another patient with a trauma and you can see on this side there is pneumothorax and here you can see there are multiple fracture ribs there are fracture ribs at multiple sites and there is also surgical emphysema here again there is something again the patient is having a massive injury with multiple fracture ribs at different points and it's also a case of a flail chest so flail chest is a common x-ray that is kept human pneumothorax is again a common x-ray that is kept you will also have x-rays with a fracture clavicle so look at carefully at the clavicle the ribs the pneumothorax uh, pneumo whether the the lung uh, the, the pleural cavity is um, is hyperlucent and also whether there is a free fluid level so that is what you to be seen let us see this x-ray this x-ray is not you know, on a non-traumatic patient and uh, what is a typical sign in this x-ray so if you look at both sides, you can see on the right side there is some appearance isn't it and this is a typical appearance of hydatid disease. What is hydatid sign of that X-ray? Hydatid sign of a plain X-ray is a water lily sign. So hydatid disease of the lung parenchyma is, is next to liver disease. The liver is a common one involved. And then the questions will be asked to is on the based on the hydatid disease. So this is a typical X-ray of water lily sign of for a, a hydatid test. Then what about this? What is the X-ray finding of this patient, this X-ray? This X-ray, when you look at, you can see that left-sided dome of the diaphragm is elevated, right? And there is a fluid fluid level also. What is this condition? When you have this X-ray, you should not diagnose it as a single diagnosis. You should have multiple diagnoses in this patients. The differential diagnosis. So the differential diagnosis of this case include what all things there is an air fluid level in the lung in the lung region so it can be a hydropneumothorax right if there is a trauma history it could be a hemoneumothorax it can be a lung cyst with a fluid level right a lung cyst with a fluid level lung abscess with the fluid level it can be very very common condition it can be a diaphragmatic hernia or a weakening of the diaphragm so that the diaphragm is elevated that is called as eventration of the diaphragm. So how will you reevaluate these patient? What is the next investigation? You have to go for a chest X-ray. Or even if you are taking a simple uh, plain X-ray, what you have to put, do is put a Riles tube and see where is the Riles tube coming, right? And if it comes below this, that means that this is an elevated diaphragm. Right, and that is a sign to differentiate by plain X-ray for X-ray, plain X-ray in case of a eventration of the diaphragm. Eventration of the diaphragm is nothing but weakening of the diaphragm on one side, so it becomes thinned out and it forms an arched loop. Right. What about this? This is again a plain X-ray, X-ray chest with the diaphragm. And when you look at this X-ray of the diaphragm, this is this you may be you may be confused and hyperlucent uh, the lung shadows. 
But what is more important is look below the diaphragm. So whenever you see the diaphragm with the chest, always look below the diaphragm to see whether there is any free gas under diaphragm. What are the differential diagnosis of free gas under diaphragm? Any hollow viscous perforations, right? Any hollow viscous perforations, there will be free gas under diaphragm. So you should always think about hollow viscous perforations if there is a free gas under diaphragm. And the condition which commonly predispose to hollow viscous perforations are, or which produces hollow viscous, the commonest condition is what? Commonest condition is duodenal ulcer perforation. So naturally the questions will be, how will you manage a perforation peritonitis? And you should know how exactly you manage a perforation peritonitis, right? Nilorly, Riles tube, IV fluids, correction of fluid electrolyte imbalance, and antibiotics, and then do a laparotomy. What are the other conditions causing air under diaphragm? Can be perforations of the small intestine in endric perforations, colorectal perforations of malignancy, very rarely appendicular perforations. It can be in a patient who had a post-operative patient. It can be post-laparoscopic patient, right? A patient who underwent hysterosalpingography and a patient who has got very rarely necrotizing or emphysematous uh, inflammations of the bowel as well as the uh, gallbladder. So common conditions first, the most common condition is duodenal or gastric ulcer perforations. So naturally the questions will be on peptic ulcer perforations and its management. Now what about this? This is a typical x-ray of a patient on a newborn baby and it shows a double bubble sign. What is the x-ray? What is the finding? What is the diagnosis? A double bubble sign is classical of a classical of what? Classical of a duodenal atresia. A duodenal atresia which is a congenital disorder when the second part of the duodenum is obstructed by a web and the classical sign is a double bubble or uh, sign a single bubble sign when the only dilated gastric shadow is seen in hypertrophic pyloric stenosis and a triple uh, bubble uh, bubble appearance is seen in a jejunal atresia so remember a double bubble appearance and double bubble appearance is classically described in a case of a duodenal atresia now what about this this is again an x-ray, it's an unusual x-ray, I don't think you need to know much about it, where you get air pockets in the region of the stomach, multiple air pockets in a plain x-ray in the region of the stomach. And this is classical of a condition called as phytobezoar. Phytobezoar is nothing but, phytobezoar is nothing but when the patient eats a lot of phyto uh, tree or uh, the, 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 the hair balls and the gas get trapped between the hair balls that is, and that is a typical of a phytobezoar. Now coming to one of a common x-rays, whenever a patient comes to you with a abdominal pain, abdominal distension, vomiting and constipation, you take an x-ray of the abdomen and in a case of a suspected intestinal obstruction. What x-ray will you take? You will take a plain x-ray, abdomen, erect view or a supine view, isn't it? An erect view to see whether there is any air fluid levels and a supine view to again to see an air fluid level and dilated bowel shadows. When will you say the bowel is dilated? When will you say the bowel is diluted? By looking at a pattern itself, you will be able to identify what sort of dilatation it is and what sort of a problem it is. So whenever you get a dilated bowel shadow, you look at whether it is dilated more than what it is. And there are typical regions in the in the bowel uh, which exhibit different patterns. And one of the patterns which you normally see is what is called as the volvule conivendus appearance for jejunum. You can see here there are hostrations which are distributed e opposite to each other. There is something like a coin stack appearance, right? The hostrations are equivalently opposite to each other. Ilium has got a characterless appearance and jejunum show and bowel, the large bowel shows hostrations which are not opposite to each other. The dilated bowel shadows where the hostrations are not opposite to each other. So you, see, you tell a bowel is dilated when the jejunum is dilated more than 3 centimeters colon 6 and cecum 9, right? So 6 centimeters dilated in the colon and 9 centimeter for the cecum, you consider this as a dilated bowel. So here you can say dilated bowel and see the typical pattern of the jejunal dilatation. So you can very well say where exactly is obstruction. You can say the obstruction is possibly in the ileum, right?
when you look at this x-ray this is again an air fluid level you can see multiple air fluid levels right and that is you can see the Ryle's tube with the lead shots here right the lead shots on the top normally when you take a plain x-ray how many shadows are seen you see two shadows one are the gastric funders and one are the right leg force maybe three but if you see more than that that means there is paraticulous there is dynamic or a dynamic obstruction and the bowel is distended so here you can see this bowel is jejunum because you can see the volvule condimentous appearance you can also see small amounts of the bowels which doesn't have any pattern at all so that means it's an ileal ileal, ileal dilatation also so put together all of them this is probably a ileal obstruction isn't it and how will you treat a bowel obstruction that will be the next Next question again any acute abdomen the principle remains the same nil oral IV fluid correction of fluid electrolyte imbalance antibiotics and then do laparotomy right that is a basic principle for any bowel obstruction now coming to the next x-ray this is also a typical x-ray of a phytobezoar you can see there is dial air there there is gas pockets and air pockets in the region of the stomach right or trichobezoar of the stomach right that is typical trichobezoar x-ray and trichobezoar can occupy the entire stomach and form a pattern of the stomach and they are typically treated by gastrotomy and extraction if they are large trichobezoar or phytobezoar if a small trichobezoar or phytobezoar you can do an endoscopic extractions right now what about this x-ray this is a typical x-ray of a condition you can see there is there is a this is like a this is a this is a omega like appearance you have seen omega isn't it this is an omega z like appearance and this is a typical appearance of uh, sigmoid volvulus sigmoid volvulus typically produce a different x-ray sign one is an omega sign second is a bend inner tube uh, sign of bend inner tube tire sign you can see what is called as a coffee bean sign coffee bean sign you can get the rosenthal sign converging three line sign and there are various signs on plain x-ray and it is almost typical to diagnose you can see the hostations here one is here one is here and the other one is here so it's a colon that is dilated and all these loops they can see they originate at the region of the sigmoid volvulus and sigmoid volvulus x-ray is typical and that will be commonly asked and you'll be asked what are the causes how will you treat all these things can be asked in sigmoid volvulus and what is a barium sign of sigmoid volvulus barium sign of sigmoid volvulus or barium enema sign of sigmoid volvulus is the bird's beak appearance we will come to bird's beak appearance when we talk about achalasia cardia later but bird's beak appearance on barium enema is typically seen in sigmoid volvulus so these are common plain x-rays that will be as you will be also shown some stones in the region of the pancreatic stones which i will probably show later where you get calcified pancreatic stones are the transversely going across the abdomen or you will be stoned renal stones either in the form of a stagon calculi or a simple renal stone again these are the common plain x-rays from the abdomen that will be shown that will be shown to you so this actually completes the plain x-ray area right now we are going to the next level that is the that is the special investigations so when you talk about special investigations you have got uh, investigations in the form of barium first and there are barium barium signs barium uh, swallow barium meal barium swallow through and barium enema right that is the first set let us go from one by one barium swallow is used to evaluate the esophagus barium meal is used to evaluate the stomach and the duodenum barium follow through is to evaluate the uh, the small bowel and the barium enema is used to evaluate the colorectum as well as the terminal ileum so just understand those meanings so this is a barium swallow and you can see a web what is the condition you can see a web and that is a condition of a peterson kelly syndrome or plummer wilson syndrome right and you know the triad of plummer wilson syndrome and the precancerous nature of that the next x-ray again a barium swallow showing a pouch what is this pouch this is a this is the curse through the Killian stations. This is a pharyngeal diverticulum. The pharyngeal diverticulum and the, the presentation, the treatment, the complications, anything can be asked from this. Right. What is this? 
This is again a diaphragm, a web which is seen in the lower esophagus. Lower esophagus is a gastroesophageal junction and that is called as the Schatzky ring. Schatzky ring that is typical of a lower esophageal web. Right. So and that is usually treated by balloon dilatation. Now again you can get diverticulums of the esophagus either very close to the, the stomach in the region of the gastroesophageal junction. They are called as epiphrenic diverticulum and when you get diverticulum of the mid esophagus that is called as the mid esophageal diverticulum and all the diverticula are usually pulsion diverticulum due to pressure changes and only when there is a definite there is a mid diverticula can be secondary to histoplasmosis due to traction or others are secondary to pulsion or pressure changes. Right. Now what is this x-ray? This is a typical x-ray of a bird's peak appearance. What condition causes bird's peak appearance? It is caused by the achalasia cardia. In achalasia cardia, you know what is achalasia cardia. I am not going to detail in this class because the questions will be what is achalasia cardia? How will you diagnose achalasia cardia? The investigation of choice is not barium. It is a it is a it is a esophageal manometry. Then what are the complications of achalasia cardia? Aspiration pneumonitis. You can get perforation. You can get malignancy. What is the treatment of achalasia cardia? You can do a balloon dilatation, botulinum toxin. You can do Heller's cardiomyotomy. You can do laparoscopic Heller's cardiomyotomy. And the new treatment is POEM, that is peroral endoscopic myotomy. So these are the questions that is. In achalasia cardia. This is also a case where you get, get an early achalasia cardia, the terminal esophagus. Then achalasia cardia, the other x-ray changes are other than the, the bird's peak appearance, you can have a rat tail appearance. Then when the esophagus is hugely dilated, you can get megaloesophagus. You can get what is called as mediastinal double stripe sign, right? Mediastinal double stripe sign. And this is a typical of a apple core appearance. Apple core appearance of the middle third of esophagus that is typical of a plain x-ray barium si solo sign of a malignancy of the esophagus. Malignancy of the esophagus if it is upper third it produces inverted inverted champagne box appearance. If it is middle third it produces apple core appearance. If it is lower third it produces rat tailing. Rat tailing you can get both in achalasia as well as in malignancy. But in achalasia, you get a smooth rat tailing, while in malignancy, you get an irregular rat tailing. Right. Now, this is also a case of an achalasia cardia. Now, what is this appearance? This is a barium solo appearance of a condition where you get, where there is a spasm of esophagus. And this appearance is classically called as a corkscrew esophagus. Corkscrew esophagus is typical appearance of diffuse esophageal spasm and this is also this is a condition which occurs secondary to esophageal esophageal dysmotility syndrome esophageal dysmotility syndrome now coming to the barium meals you can see this appearance you can get the esophagus the ge junction and the stomach and the stomach appears to be very thinned out it is not dilated at all and this is typical of an appear a typical appearance of a leather bottle appearance seen in linitis plastica and linitis plastica is nothing but it's a diffuse infiltrating malignancy of the stomach and it is treated by a total gastrectomy what is this x-ray this is also a barium elima barium swallow barium meal appearance and you can see the greater curve has gone up and the lesser curve below. This is a condition called as gastric volvulus. Gastric volvulus is a rotation of the stomach around its axis. And this is typical x-ray of a gastric volvulus. And gastric volvulus is typically seen as a case of, in case, and there are two types, organoaxial and mesentricoaxial. Organoaxial is the most common type. And this is classically present with the both charts triad. Both star triad is nothing but you have got what all things you have got uh, abdominal pain, vomiting, and inability to pass an endoscope, and it is treated by laparotomy and gastropexy. And what is this? And this is a this is a barium appearance where the stomach is compartmentalized into two compartments. Okay, 
and this is called uh, this is this is when occur when the when the when the stomach is compartmentalized this occurs in a chronic cicatrizing incisural gastric ulcer right the sto that is that is uh, so that is called as a dumbbell stomach appearance stomach has got two dumbbells one above and one below with a narrow constriction this is typical of a chronic gastric ulcer right? chronic gastric ulcer this is again an x-ray appearance which is seen in case of a stomach cancer, incisural cancer in a, bin, in a barium meal x-ray. And you can see there is a meniscal sign on where the arrows last stands. And this, this sign is called as the, this sign is called as the Carman's meniscal sign. It is asked in many of the entrance exams, but the x-ray is normally not asked for undergraduate exam, but this is a barium appearance of a malignant gastric ulcer. You have got an irregular gastric ulcer. The rugosal folds are not reaching to the edge of the ulcer and you can get a meniscal sign. Right. When you look at a benign gastric ulcer, you can see there is a smooth projection at the incisura. And this is called as the, this is called as a hudak knife. Right. That is called as a howdak knife. Or, uh, and there is a line which goes across. That is called as the Hampton's, Hampton's line and there is an incisural defect, right? So those are the signs of the benign gastric ulcer. Now, what is this X-ray? This is a typical X-ray which, which shows, this is a typical X-ray which shows the stomach mucosa very well, duodenal mucosa very well and a projection. I don't want you to diagnose this problem, but this problem is typical of a condition. So this investigation is what is called as the hypotonic duodenography hypotonic duodenography with a benign gastric or duodenal diaphragm right now what about this this is a typical x-ray of a barium enema and what does it shows it shows there are multiple multiple punched out defect right and this typical appearance is called as a thumb printing sign what condition causes thumb printing sign Thumb printing sign is caused by ischemic colitis, mesenteric ischemia. Ischemic colitis, and this is a typical X-ray of mesenteric ischemia. And where do you get mesenteric ischemia commonly? It occurs in the left, the left side of the splenic flexure, which is an area of hypovascularity. All right. Now, what about this? This is again a barium appearance where there is multiple thorn-like appearance, right? And this is called as the what is this appearance called? This is called a Rosthorn appearance, isn't it? Or you can you can see multiple outpouchings, multiple outpouchings on the sigmoid region, typical of a diverticulosis of the colon. Diverticle, multiple outpouchings, right? So uh, that is typical of a, uh, a diverticular disease of the colon, and that is commonly seen in case of a trisigmoid colon, and typically treated by complicated by diverticulitis perforation and abscess formation and colovesical fistulas. What about this? You can see there are no hostile pattern at all in the colon. And this is a, this is a typical x-ray what is called as a lead pipe appearance. And lead pipe appearance is typically seen in ulcerative colitis. What the ulcer, you get lead pipe or you get pipe stem appearance where there are no hostration seen. And <clears throat> what do you get in, uh, what, what is x-ray sign you get in Crohn's disease? Crohn's disease affects the terminal ileum and it produces a typical x-ray sign of string sign of candor, isn't it? String sign of candor, that is the x-ray sign of a, a Crohn's disease. A lead pipe or a tube, a stem pipe appearance is typically seen in case of ulcerative colitis. Now, what about the picture on the right? You get a barium picture with a clasp knife appearance. Clasp knife deformity or pincer grass deformity. That is typical of indusception. Indusception. Right. Indusception, typical appearance is a clasp knife or a pincer grass appearance. And you will have questions on indusception. What are the appearances? Where do you get indusception? What is the age group? What are the common causes of adult indusception? All these things you be prepared. Now, what about this? Here you get you are getting multiple intestinal uh, shadows, isn't it? You get multiple intestinal and intestinal subserosal gas shadows. And this is a rare condition. 
that is the nematosis intestinalis typically seen in jejunum it is a benign condition it's not it doesn't have any issues you can leave it alone but it is a benign condition now that is a pincer graft deformity again you can see the typical close sign or pincer graft sign now what about this this is a typical apple core appearance apple core appearance in carcinoma of the colon apple you just eat the apple and you can see the core and that is typical of a carcinoma of the colon and the questions can be related to the cancer of the colon now this is actually a, a hypotonic uh, hypotonic barium enema where you get a small shadow right that is of a polyp and this sign is called as the mexican hat sign mexican hat sign now what about this what is this x-ray this is a this is a intravenous pilogram right what is the contrast agent used that will be asked and what are the what are the x-rays taken what are the advantage what is the finding there you can see there is a there is a narrowing in the central part of the duo, the the ureters of both sides and you can get dilated tortuous ureters you have also have got dilated pelvic calicial system and the major and the minor calicis but the problem is normally the ureters run transversely down but here the ureters are displaced medially right but whenever you get an ivp what you look at is the one is the position of the ureters whether the ureters are dilated whether there is blunting of minor calyces that is the first sign of hydronephrosis then the major calyces dilate then the pelvis dilate then the ureter dilates right but in this x-ray you can see the ureters have been deviated medially on both sides and this is a typical ivp picture of a idiopathic retroperitoneal fibrosis where the first organ to be involved is ureters it's called as an hormones disease and it classically presents with fibrosis of the retroperitoneum but this x-ray is projected not to discuss that this x-ray is to project is projected to see how is a ivp red and ivp red, ivp is red use i'm telling only the q points look at the ureters the position of the urea they normally follow the transverse process on either side whether the ureters are dilated and tortuous minor calyces are blunder the major calyces are dilated and also the pelvic calyceal right and this is again a typical sign of an adder head appearance on the on a ure on on ivp on 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 evacuation films and that is typical of a urethro seal adder head appearance now coming to this x-ray this is a common x-ray that is kept for you what is this what is this investigation this is you can see an endoscope and you can see the biliary system and the pancreatic duct so what is the investigation this is endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreatography isn't it ercp and you inject the dye that is a megalomin iethalmate isn't it and you image to see whether there are any stone structures and whether there are any other growth right and ercp is usually done using a side viewing endoscope and what are the advantage of ercp ercp can be diagnostic and can be therapeutic there are various ercp sign one is called as the chain of leg appearance chain of leg appearance is typically seen in chronic pancreatitis you can get a double duct sign that is sign of carcinoma of the pancreas you can get you can get rail track sign that is seen of biliary ascariasis right okay so there are simple signs but you just remember these three signs at least and you can also see the the stones complication of ercp the most common complication is pancreatitis the next is bleeding perforation or the other two complications it can induce pancreatitis when you do a sphincter right what does this x-ray show this x-ray shows there are stones isn't it there is an ercp with stones so what will you do you can do a sphincterotomy and extract the stone you, this x-ray also shows multiple filling defects in the common bile duct and that is also typical of a typical of a ercp finding typical of an x-ray of the typical of uh, stones on the, the common bile duct cholelithiasis, and the treatment options will be discussed if there is time this is ERCP sign of a double duct sign, which I already said due to carcinoma pancreas. Right. So ERCP is a common investigation. Another investigation they were commonly kept is T tube cholangiograms and the 
PTC, percutaneous transhepatic cholangio cholangiography, which is done for proximal biliary tract tumors, and PTC and, and T tube cholangiogram is done when there is a T tube. You will see the T tube as well as the biliary tree. That is done after coli docolithotomy or CBD exploration, open or laparoscopic. What is this? This is a thyroid scan where you get, you can, it is, it showing a definite uh, nodule in the thyroid, which is a hot spot. So that is thyroid scan. This is an MIBG scan, which is used for pheochromocytoma, pheochromocytoma. This is a HIDA scan used for biliary system, the biliary system. This is a Doppler, arterial Doppler and typical arterial Doppler. The signs are usually triphasic when there are no obstruction. You can see it's a triphasic wave and whenever there is obstruction, it becomes a biphasic wave and nonophasic wave. This is a TAT scan which shows multiple hypoechoic lesion throughout the liver, which is also typical of a secondaries of the liver. And what are the most common secondaries which occur in the liver? They are the from the bronchial tree and also from the GI tract that is from the colon. Colon is more than bronchial tree. So colon is the most common organ and you should also you should know the features of the liver secondary. This is again a CT where you get a segment one hypertrophy in case of a CT with all other segments. You can see the entire liver is hypertrophic, but one segment has increased in size, typical of butt Chiari syndrome. Hydatid cyst has got a typical uh, CT appearance that is called as a split wall sign or a camelot, appear, camelot sign and on ultrasound it produces various signs and one of the signs that is described is uh, a cartilage sign. This is a liver cyst and what is this investigation? I am just scanning through a few more slides. This investigation is endoscopic ultrasound. Normally not kept, but if somebody asks you, you can see the ultrasound sits there and the layers have been imagined. And this is actually in the fourth layer that you can get a shadow. And what is this? This is an MRCP of the liver and it shows a typical sign that is called as a rosary sign. This is an ultrasound of the sign, ultrasound with a typical radiographic sign of a rat tail deformity typical of an adenomyosis of the gold bladder and what is this investigation this is mrcp magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography where you are you are, it is a non-invasive investigation and normally i normally ask what is a dye used for mrcp there is no dye and it is commonly it is it is imaged by bile itself right now what is this investigation where you can see the inside the lumen of the the bowel the large bowel that is virtual colonoscopy and virtual colonoscopy you fly through the colon and you can actually see inside the colon and identify small polyps and the deformities and this is a clo test where what is the indication h pylori clo test is rapid urease test where you get an immediate diagnosis in h pylori commonly asked as a picture test in various exams this is an angiogram, a typical conventional angiogram, Seldinger's technique, where you are imaging, you are putting a cannula, a catheter to the to the iota and inject and image the, uh, the vessels below. Right. And you can see there is defect and can be treated accordingly. Right. Here you can see the left side is okay, the right side there is definite obstruction. Right. Now, this is a digital subtraction angiography where you can get the vessels as well as a vascular, all other tissues are subtracted, digitally subtracted. That is typical of a digital subtraction angiography. That is a CT of the abdomen, a 64 slice CT, where the abdomen is well imaged. The vessels are 3D reconstructed. So now for vascular imaging, you can either do an MR angiograph or a CT angiogram, which is 64 or 128 CT angiogram, right? Now coming to certain other special x-rays quickly, one of these is this, that is a, 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 a x-ray of the breast, which is typical of a, uh, the features of a mammogram, which is the x-ray of the breast, and also the benign features of mammogram, which you should know. Mammographic features of a malignant breast include the diagnostic problems of uh, uh, the, uh, the structural architecture and benign and calcification, while in case of benign lesion, you get well-defined macrocalcifications. 
For example, you get popcorn calcifications or mulberry calcifications in fibroadenoma. You get curvilinear calcifications in mammogram in case of uh, fibrocystic disease. And uh, you get irregular stellate classifications in case of malignancy. Right. Now, what is the diagnosis? There can be picture-based questions. This is thyroglossal cyst. You can be asked anything about thyroglossal cyst. What is its appearance? That is appearance of a typical PUD of orange appearance in a malignancy of the breast. What is the appearance on the left breast? <coughs> you can see the nipple areola complex is completely destroyed. That is Page's disease of the breast. What is the clinical staging of Page's disease? Clinical staging of the Page's disease is TIS. That is, that is, that is a TIS. That is a clinical staging. And what is this test? That is the what is the classical the classical test used to 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 to, to, to have a more exposure of the thyroid. That is a Pizzillo's method. And you can see a chain of lake appearance on this X-ray on MRCP that is seen that is seen in chronic pancreatitis. You can see a typical Roston appearance. You can see a sore tooth appearance in case of the second part of the duodenum that is typically seen in periambulary carcinoma. This is a gross appearance typically suggestive of an uh, the uh, cholesterosis of the gallbladder. Cholesterosis of the gallbladder that is ERCP picture showing double duct sign. Again, ERC uh, barium solo appearing to showing a diffuse esophageal spasm, sigmoid volvulus, a bend. You can see a typical coffee bean sign and a dilated bowel shadows uh, with a coffee bean sign, a omega sign, Rosendahl sign, and barium sign. I already said is typical of of a sigmoid volvulus is a big appearance. You can see an apple core appearance in case of a castrum of the esophagus, double bubble sign. Classical of uh, biliary vomiting and duodenopatia. That is Michael's diverticulum. What is this condition when there is a peri or peri uh, lip staining? That is Peutz-Jeghers syndrome. That is Peutz-Jeghers syndrome. This X-ray you have already seen a tube plus tube up, a tube stem appearance or a lead pipe appearance in ulcerative colitis. You can see this X-ray where you can see free gas and the diaphragm on a plain X-ray. You require 10 ml of air to detect on a plain X-ray and 1 ml of air on CT. So CT is most sensitive, but we commonly use plain X-ray, X-ray chest diaphragm to diagnose uh, duodenal uh, uh, perforations. That is a typical X-ray sign, X-ray showing stargone calculus, the calcium oxalate stones, calcium oxalate stone. Then earliest sign of uh, tuberculosis uh, on IVP is a moth-eaten callus appearance moth eaten callus appearance. Here you can see there is multiple shadows on x-ray, the cannonball shadows, typical of x-ray of the typical of uh, malignancies of renal cell carcinomas and also on follicular carcinoma of the thyroid. That is that is a typical CT appearance of ADH and you can see this that is a typical that is a double J10 U4 